how can we have relative God? There can only be one absolute God. If one was to say that there is no God at all, and we just That's just another, just another thing that your heart and your mind will reject. How can there be no creator and things exist with all this beauty and perfection? And complexity and harmony? There has to be an organizer. If, if there is no organizer, if there is no organizer, we won't even do that. So we constitute ourselves a specific body form. Beautiful. Very organized. When you breathe in this air, this air has a lot of components, but we utilize some of it, goes through our lungs, process it, yeah, it's like when you, when we exchange it. Use the oxygen, get rid of the carbon dioxide. And we are just food. We yeah, yeah. Food, food, same thing. Yeah, yeah. So all of this demonstrates that there is a process built in yeah, by makes something sense. that is intelligent and yeah. wise. It's not a product of nothingness. It's not coincidence. Yeah. Coincidence. Yeah. Or chance. So your question about if there was nothing as a creator, God, no God, this world would not make any sense. If there's no God, there should be nothing in existence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What about many gods? Have you ever driven a car when there are two independent steering wheels? I did when I was learning driving. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The driving instructor, do you know that? Yeah, Some of them have one. Yeah, yeah. But they have a clutch or something or a brake. Right. Now imagine you have a car made with independent controls, left and right. Both of you in the car, you're not talking to each other anymore, you want to take the car to the north, and you say, no, I'm going to take the car to the south. Where's the car going to go? Because you have independent control of this car. This car is not going to go, if it goes to the north, then you were overpowered by him. So you're saying if, if people need to come to... No, I'm talking about the universe. Okay. If the universe was a product of many gods, this universe would be in corruption and chaos and ruin. Imagine one god who's absolute says, rain now. Other gods says, no, I want thunder and sunshine, whatever. It's yeah, not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, You'll yeah. be chaos and corruption and the whole universe will be destroyed. One god says, I don't want this, you know, this earth. I want to get it destroyed right now. I don't like it. Another God says, I like it, I want it to be here, what's going to happen? Same kind of things. You cannot have more than one absolute being. So polytheism, or belief in more than one God, is something that your heart and your mind will reject. So those be people who believe there's more if than they, one God... They can't they like, how do you say? If they compromise, together, yeah. if they were, then they are not absolute. An absolute being doesn't compromise. An absolute but can't being, they be absolute together? Okay, think about, okay, let me give you another example when we're talking about an absolute being. An absolute God has qualities of absolute for everything in terms of qualities. Knowledge, power, will, and so on. Imagine now, there's two absolute beings, and they're all knowledgeable. One of them wants to keep his ideas secret. Can he do that when the other one is all knowledgeable? He's going to find out because he's all knowledgeable. So you are actually now saying, I cannot keep my ideas secret, meaning I am limited, deficient. I've been overpowered by something else. I'm not absolute. So this is what the Quran actually points to in one of the verses. Now, كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَا فَسَدَتَ Had there been more than one gods, there will be chaos and corruption and ruin. Yeah? So polytheism, or multiple deities or gods, is not something that is rational, intellectual, reasonable, or believable. What is left with then, when there is, there has to be a God, not nothing, there cannot be multiple gods, you are left with the concept of one creator, one absolute being. There are not many, there are not many, one is, there are not many creators, or a concept. Should I put it in? How many more? <laughs> there are not many concepts, which are like this, so you're talking about monotheistic, religions or belief systems and these are like mainly Judaism, Christianity in some way and Islam in the purest form. Okay? So we Muslims say from the very beginning, from the very beginning when man was placed on this earth there has always been this one religion, one ideology, one thing which is, which is, which is believing in and submitting to this one absolute creator. The same creator 
guided people at multiple times and places with the same message. But what went wrong is this people started moving away from this message and making up their own, corrupting it. Imagine the message says... Different interpretations and stuff. Imagine the message was, be just, don't steal. And there was guys who were in power and says, but we want to be more powerful. I want to loot and get all this wealth. And he said, the only way I can do that is by somehow changing the scripture, this message of God and saying, it's okay, you know what? If you loot other people other than your own tribe or your own nation or your own country, it's okay. This is how it corrupt, corruption comes in, in the scripture. And we find this in quite a few religions where it's saying, it's okay to be with this behavior with the goyim, the non Gen, you know, Gentiles. Have you heard of the word Gentiles and going? Oh, I don't even know what okay. is that. So you have a religious tradition like the Jewish people. They are the Jews, the chosen one of God. And everyone else is the Gentiles, the Goyims. Um, you treat them differently than you treat yourself. Let's okay. second so not necessarily, but people, people who are not Jewish. Jewish. No. People who are not born Jew. Oh. They have the way you treat them, like for example, as so a Jew, you treat, you as treat, a Jew, yeah, yeah. you cannot charge interest and usury because that's coming from greed. Imagine I want to build a house, I don't have money. You're rich. So I go to get money from you, you gave me you know, 50,000 pounds. And then you say, look, give me 100,000 pounds back. Why? You have no problem in your deficiency in money. You are so rich. Even if I did not give the money back to you, it's not going to decrease your wealth. And I was in need. You, from your compassion, because you're a compassionate human being, gave me, okay, fine, give me your money back, you know, one year later. But demanding give me, on top of that, another 50,000 pounds, yeah, that's yeah. greed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interest is actually this, where you charge extra based on this greed. So, in Islam, it's absolutely forbidden. In Judaism, you, can, you cannot charge interest to another Jew, Jew yeah. but to a non-Jew, you can. Do you see where the problem starts? Because when you treat people differently with this kind of things, this is where I think in the past, the scripture eventually gets corrupted like this, where people have moving away from the real essence of the message that God gave for everyone, and you have it for your own self, your own tribe, your own family, and for everyone else that's different. So as time went by, people changed this message. And then they introduced the ideas of different things, and that's why you have so many different religions. But if you were to really deeply ponder on the roots of the religion, even in Hinduism that we talked about right now, that they're polytheistic, if you go to the scripture, it will say, there's one God and not two. It's there, it's still there. See, it's still something that you can decipher and you can actually, um, what was this called, extract from this, you know, layers and layers of <laughs> distortion. There is this core message that there's only one God. So polytheism or multiple belief system arose because people went away from the original message of God and they corrupted it. God, our creator, he isn't someone who just leaves people astray and do whatever he want. He sends another prophet and another messenger, even to the same nation. That's why we, we, we are told in the Quran that God does not punish anyone, meaning he doesn't require anyone of what they're doing until and unless he sends a prophet or a messenger. <laughs> because that's only just. Imagine now the police comes along just over there and says, put handcuff on, arrest. Um, uh, you have committed the crime um, punishable by death because you are speaking in speaker's corner. They can't do that because there is no law preceding this. If there was a law, they have to make it clear that speaking in speaker's corner is a crime punishable by death. We were not aware of it. They didn't make it known. So God does not account people for what they do until he tells them what they're supposed to do. That's why the prophets and messengers comes and tells us, this is what you should do. Be good and kind and compassionate and merciful and just. Don't be greedy, don't deceive, don't cheat, don't lie, don't rape, don't murder. Do's and don'ts. And many of these do's and don'ts, as you alluded to earlier, it's something that is common to everyone. Why? Because that was the message that God sent to everyone. It's still there. It's still there. So can I just say, so what, so what we were talking about is, um, 
So we were saying that this, the, the guy over here was saying he was talking about Christianity, what, yeah, Christianity and why um, they are wrong. Yeah, they are wrong, and I'm and I'm right. Basically. So what I was saying is, the, so you're talking about all the creationism and God and stuff. The the, the the thing is, no one we can say everyone has their own opinions, but no one knows for that. That's that's what I'm. That's no one knows for a fact. What is what is the truth of creation? This has happened where where people living today. This has happened so many years ago. No one knows about that. So for all all these people, they're just they're just following their beliefs and their religion and their they're following their truth. They're following their truth based on what's happened to them in their life and what's like the, the impacts of the world. So basically, I, how I do we know it's the truth? How do we know? It's not the not truth? necessarily. I'm just saying. I'm just saying for the gentleman over here that was talking about. I'm wrong, you're right, my religion is wrong, your religion is right. I personally think that's something that shouldn't be done because religion as all all based religions, yes, it's like as you said, like people misinterpret stuff and try to twist twist religions and use it in bad ways and stuff. But at their base at, at, and at their foundation, all the purpose of all religions is good and is to, to help people live a better life and help people do good. So I personally think you shouldn't. I shouldn't tell tell someone I'm I'm right and you're wrong. Just you know, you know what I mean. Like, yeah, just, just to address this point. So it seems logical in a way. What you said said, but we need to think you know uh, deep enough. And this is what Islam demands us to be: critical thinking, deep reflection on our own self, on our universe around us, and then we will easy for us to come to the right conclusions. So as I said. The Islamic model or the understanding of religion is this: there has always been one way of life acceptable to God, only one way, and that has been from the very beginning to the very last of the Prophet and Messenger. What has happened throughout this time is people have changed it into different forms. So our role of the mind is to find out the uncorrupted form if it exists, to say it does, from the corruption. So what are the signs of corruption is what we should be asking. So there are various ways of looking at it. You can study every single religion, which are monotheistic, or you can start with one and go one by other, depending on how much time you have. Okay? So when people say we have no right to judge others, that's true, but we still have to decipher the truth from all these around us. And there can only be one truth, not conflicting truth. If God is one, think about it, if God is one and he alone is to be thanked for, to be glorified and praised, that's worshipping. Yeah. And then in one religion it says, I have a son, worship him too. Or I have a wife, worship her too. Or if you worship my wife or my daughter or my son, I'm going to put you into hellfire forever and forever. And another religion. What's that, what's that, so you said about like uh, prophets and stuff. You should only uh, follow uh, as a prophet. So is what, it, what isn't Jesus? In, 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 in Islam, Jesus is a prophet. And in Christianity, what? So he is, he not, is by, by the son way, of God. By the way, I'm not a uh, practicing Christian, so I don't know. Really <laughs> we can all learn from each other. That's the whole idea. Yeah. So. In Christianity, he's considered to be a son of God yeah. and elevated also to God. Yeah. Okay? That's why many people, they will not say he's son of God, they will say he's God. If you press them too hard, he said he's a son of God and there is a father of God. Okay, it's like God. He's, he's the human form. Is he, he, he's God in flesh. They he's, say. he's just bringing God in flesh. Yeah, they so say he's yeah, God in flesh. Yeah, okay, yeah. so we will just address this point, but at least we have an understanding that there's ways of finding out the truth. Because if there are conflicting con concepts of God, you know very well, you know very well, they cannot all be the truth. God has a son, you should worship him too. And God has no son, if you worship God having a son, you're going to go to hell. Two different contrasting concepts and message. They both cannot be true, they're mutually exclusive. So that's why we need to understand um, how do we then filter this? Okay? One way of this is by looking at the very concept itself of God and also the revelation. Because the revelation of God or the scripture, the book that God sends to guide people, because how did God guide people throughout times? 
the various levels of guidance. In our understanding, God guides people even without sending prophets and messengers by, by the, the internet, by showing them guidance within themselves. Okay? To give you an example, imagine there is an idol worshipper who has made a statue, an idol of some kind, and is meditating and worshipping that God, or worshipping God through the statue. During that meditation, a dog came, lifted his, one of his legs and urinated on the idol. And it broke the meditation of the worship, that individual. And he said, how could, this, how, how could this dog do that? He started trying to grab this dog to you know, punish it. The dog started running. He ran after the dog. As he was running after the dog, it clicked suddenly on his head. Hang on. If I am worshipping a god who can't even stop himself from defiling by a dog, I'm worshipping a god who cannot even protect itself from defilement, being urinated upon. How can uh, that even be God? And, but the thing is, in animals, humans, we all have free will. So I think you're... No, I'm I not think, talking about the animal. I'm talking about... He's yeah, talking. He's thinking about God. Yeah, yeah. The so, God is worshipping so it's not, it's has no power itself, yeah. an idol, uh, to uh, even yeah, to be yeah, yeah, yeah. protected from yeah. urination by yeah, a dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That click, that spark, was the guidance for that individual, that gentleman or, or woman. Because that point, he should have realized that this is not God, cannot be God. I'm worshipping the wrong understanding of God. God cannot be my idol that I've formulated. Exactly. So, so you see, there was no book, there was no prophet or a messenger. It was needed. God can directly you know, guide people through these kind of moments in life. God also gives us a foolproof method of guidance and that is through raising up a prophet or a messenger from among the people who they know to be trustworthy truthful righteous upright yeah sincere so that when this individual brings them the guidance they are easy to accept it they are ready to accept it imagine now imagine i am the most wicked person the bad person you you, you have seen me killing, plundering, cheating, lying, all this. And then I come to give you an advice, you know, be nice, don't cheat. You say, get lost, get away. I mean, you, you, know, you, you don't even practice it yourself. And you tell me. That is why all the prophets and messengers, when they came, people, they, they, their objection was like, how can God send a man uh, to guidance? But they didn't just reject this individual. Because that individual they knew was someone who was trustworthy, reliable, truthful, upright. So our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi one of the nicknames that he has is as Sadiq al Amin, the truthful, trustworthy individual. People will no doubt accept whatever he says. So even if he said, in fact, at one point during his call, when he was commissioned by God to be a prophet, you see, he didn't make himself. God made him a prophet when he was like at the age of 40. So he went into one of the hills. This is one way of them bringing the attention. And then he would shout, yeah, you know, all be people like, you know, yeah, Sabaha or this, or all this community. And people realize something very important thing is happening. They would all leave their job, their work, their studies, whatever, and they go there and find out what's wrong, what's happening. Because it's a community, um, what's this called? Call where the community is in danger, maybe some kind. So he says, look, if I told you, behind me, behind the mountain, there's an army waiting to attack you. Would you believe me? They said, yes, we believe you. We have no of you of not lying ever at all. We have never seen you lying. We believe you. Accept. We will accept what you say. So that was their testament. They said, okay, then God has made me a prophet. Accept that there's no one worthy of worship God. Reject your false deities, worship God alone. And they said, oh, no, we're not going to do that because there's a different reason why. Because their worship of the deities was also a political financial interest their finance and politics was vested in their worship of different deities that they made because there was a lot of income and prestige and status was involved with it not because they realized there's only one god they knew there was only one god but they didn't succumb or conform to this belief so god sends coming back to the point prophets and messengers the guide who are trustworthy, reliable, upright person. And when they come with the guidance, people are already receptive. 
And when the guidance is presented to them, it has its own evidence. Otherwise, anyone can believe in anything, right? So the evidence is within the guidance itself that is brought. So if we consider the concept of God in one hand, we can filter what is acceptable and what is not. If we look at the guidance itself, we can be rest assured with certainty that this is what we're supposed to believe and follow who it is. Because the revelation will bring a stop to our speculation, intellectual speculation. Because when we think about other things, we're speculating intellectually, right? So imagine now, this is something I recently um, was reading about, like, how they actually justify this. A concept of God where there are these gopis, these are like cowgirls between the age of say, you know, 12 to 14 or something, teenage young girls. They're having within their tradition bath in the banks of Ganges or Ganga or Yamuna, actually it's Yamuna, Jamuna. This is in India. So you know the story is where it may be coming from. And they're only allowed to bathe there and no man can bathe there. This is the tradition. So a specific isolated place only for women. So they bathe naked. Because between themselves this is tradition. They left their clothes on the shore. God called Krishna, one of the forms of God, or avatar or whatever they want to call him. He comes along and he takes the clothes. He goes up to a tree with the clothes and he started watching and enjoying. Sooner or later, they've noticed someone's watching them and they then demanded, you know, what are you doing here? You know, um, you know it's not something that they um, gave permission to, from to, um, give my clothes, give our clothes back. He says, no, come individually one by one from the water, naked, then I'll give you clothes back. They're trying to give a lot of reasons in terms of how you know these people who are worshipping him in the first place wanted to be um, the wife of this individual god and that's why it's okay but if you look at it he is asking for this naked girl to come open because he wants to enjoy their beauty their nakedness and the poor girls think about it does not click to you that this is god almighty the one who's just the one who's pure the one who demands purity um, to me, I'm sorry, I have to, I have to disagree with these Hindu traditions. However, you, you, you depict that this is actually like, you know, some kind of symbolism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so, so yeah, I, I agree. Like, that's so that concept of God. It's fair enough if you're, if you're, you're like singing out um, certain, certain ideas and certain arguments. Or you're filtering story, them. Story, yeah, story you're filtering from, them from a religion. Yeah, yeah. So that, so that, that, I, that I believe is because your heart and yeah, mind yeah. That has been equipped with certain ways to filter yeah. which is something not believable yeah, yeah, yeah. to something which uh, your heart and mind would be yeah, I finely be tuned with. I it, believe right? that that is a good thing. Good. Right? But, but so what, what, I, what, what I do think is that that's 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 what my point is. Um, I think religions are very broad, and there's so many ideas and so many opinions. That but you, take that, it to the conclusion. So many, yeah, yeah, I will. There's so, there's so many like uh, ideas from the religious books that you that you can apply to, to modern day life and stuff. But I think that's that, that's what my point was. That, I'm, I'm that talking about the, the religion of as a whole and the, the idea as a whole of the, the religion and the, the persons in the religion yeah. is is really good. So I feel like I, I, I shouldn't tell I shouldn't tell someone to so so if you, you you're both Muslims I shouldn't tell you because I because I don't believe in because I don't follow a certain religion I should tell you believe what I, that's believe the point what I we're discussing at this because, point we're not going to judge anything because 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 of little uh, little yeah, yeah. differing uh, do you, do you follow one thing we're not judging any yeah, no, religion no, no, course, at all course, what, course, what we're talking, doing is I'm what saying, we're doing yeah. is we are trying to filter the true and the right and the correct to. concept by using your mind alone or using the revelation. Yeah. So you've heard about the Christians talking about God, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's briefly touch upon this concept. You have a God who has a son who comes down, who's supposed to be all knowledgeable, and he says, I don't know the hour. You will see this is one of the things that we ask our Christian friends most of the time. How do you explain this? How do you justify believing in it? If you are all knowledgeable, think about it. If you are all wise and all knowledgeable from eternity to eternity, meaning you know the past, the present and the future already, 
What's your name? Owen. Owen. Now, imagine I know Owen, his name, and I don't forget. I will always know this name, yeah? Because I am all knowledgeable. Then, I go to place over there, and then I don't know your name anymore. Is that possible while well, I'm supposed to be all knowledgeable? It doesn't matter where I go, if I'm all knowledgeable all the time, I will always know your name. So what they're saying, God sent his son, who is also God, he came down on earth, took a human body, he doesn't know everything. I would say that doesn't make any sense. Because if you are all knowledgeable to begin with, you will always be all knowledgeable. You cannot be less than all knowledgeable. You cannot be. Because you know the future already. There's nothing more to know. You know it already. Then how can you not know it unless you forget? And that is an imperfection, a deficiency in a concept of God. God is a perfect being with his attributes. If he has knowledge, it's perfect knowledge. So 100% all knowledge, not 5%. And 90% you know, knowledge and 10% ignorance. It doesn't count. So, just this one example will tell you there's something definitely wrong with this belief system. Somewhere something wrong went wrong. That is why we say Christ, he came to tell people to worship God, his God, and of course he's not all knowledgeable because he's a creation of God. The creation of God, you, me and everything else, is not all knowledgeable. All wise, all knowledgeable attribute only belongs to the one absolute being that is God. Okay? So when we filter, we can arrive at the correct conclusion. Okay? And if you look at the concept presented in the books, if it doesn't get in line with your heart and your mind, there's something wrong with it. Because God who created you, created you knowing that what you are capable of accepting and capable of rejecting. He cannot force you to a book which says God is a half elephant and half man as a result of chopping the heads off the man's head, Ganesh. And then the only thing that, that's a story I have to tell you again very briefly. There was this God, he has a wife, goddess, and he has a son, right? He puts his son on the guard in front of the door, so no one goes inside, you know? So wife is there, right? Whatever reason, okay, that's just to protect the family. For whatever reason, he didn't do that, he became angry. God, the husband God, or the father God, became angry. Top, top, the head of his son. And then he eventually realized, oh, what have I done? I've killed my own son, not killed my chopped my head son. So he looked around, saw an elephant, chopped off the head of the elephant, put the elephant's head on the half decapitated body, and now you have an elephant head and a human body. His name is Ganesh. If you ever go to East London or Wembley, Middlesex, and go to a jewelry shop, the, he's the god of economics to the Hindus. They worship this, this Ganesh, you will see, elephant, the trunk, but he's got a belly and a human body. But you will ask yourself, what kind of concept of God is that? It doesn't get tuned with your heart and your mind. So what we're saying is, a concept of God, which you and I are seeking to find the truth, must make sense to you. Now, let me give you an example, I mean, I, and you tell me honestly. This is from the Quran, right? A book that we believe in. So I'll show you from the English translation. It's only four lines. A small surah. A surah is like a chapter in the Quran. And the Quran is composed of 114 surahs as a whole book. And this chapter is a whole chapter of ikhlas or purity. It presents to us the concept of God in a nutshell. And see, if your heart and your mind is finally in tune with it, or your heart and your mind says averse to it. It's not for me. Yeah? Think about it. Because the true concept of God from God through his revelation must make sense about him. Say he is Allah, the one. Allah, the eternal refuge. The one who is without father, mother, individual. Basically, he is absolute. What the God is that? He's here. He is absolute, perfect. That's what it means, the Arabic word. So, absolute, independent. He neither begets nor is born. Meaning he's not a, someone who gives birth to or produces any other. Neither himself is a product of someone else, a parent or lineage. 
nor is there to him any equivalent or likeness or comparison. So it's one and only, unique, absolute, independent, perfect. Everything relies on him, depends on him, he depends on no one. He is not born, doesn't produce offspring or children, and there is nothing co-equal or like him in any way, shape or form. Consult your heart and your mind. Does this concept of God make sense to you? There is one absolute being. Has to be one. Has to be one. No, this is just Arabic language. They have to use the language. This is how God describes it. You can use he, she, there is no it in Arabic language. So God tells us he's not a man or a woman. In fact, he created both. He is not a gender. This is just a language where the Arabs used in customary to describe God to be someone who is free from any gender. So if God used she, you can, because there's only two gender pronouns rather in Arabic language, one can ask, is God a female? Same question can ask. So what are you going to use? There is no. Either he or she, that's what you're going to use. So Arabs say the sun is one gender, the moon is one gender in terms of how you say it. No, when you say, okay, right, I went to a ship and she was beautiful. A ship using a feminine attribute. My country is England, she is beautiful. She's not feminine. But you see, when we use pronouns, customary use is not because something is a male or a female. Yeah, it's not because there's something is a male or a female. A ship is not a female, neither is a country. But we just keep pronouns because that's what we are. In English, you have another one called neuter gender, so it. In Arabic, no. So God chose the masculine gender, like he says clearly he's not a man or a woman, he, he is the creator of all things. So why did he choose the masculine? You can ask the same question, why did he choose not choose the feminine? And he will say, why did he choose the feminine? So the Arabs... Yeah, but is there an answer to it? Because in the, in the understanding where feminine gender was considered to be someone who is very gentle, uh, very kind, and compassionate, uh, someone like, you know, receptive and so on. God is saying, no, he's the creator. He's the one who also punishes. He's merciful, but he also punishes. It is not within the, uh, say, makeup of a woman to punish, yeah, to punish someone. So the, the, the Arab minds, this is my humble understanding, will be in conflict. God is like uh, describing with a she, and he's saying he's going to destroy us. I mean, come on, I mean, I mean I, I, he cannot be. Come, God cannot punish if you describe with a she. Actually. So this is just just to punish your child. Just, just uh, that's how you see women. Women. No, 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 no. no. I'm saying this is the understanding of linguistic tradition at that time. But when God then tells you that He is not anything, there's nothing like unto Him. There is nothing like unto Him. He's not a man or a woman or of any kind. Any anything that you can imagine is not God. So if He 